Hi everyone. So in this last video, we get to the crux of it, the studio setup. There are tons of videos out there about mics and recording setup. And so when we asked Joe for his tips for all you gearheads out there, he gamely dodged the question and I think gave a much more interesting take on how to make intelligent choices while buying new equipment for your studio setup. And as always, Joe has that ability to make any dull topic not only interesting, but funny and animated. So if you enjoyed this series, please take the time to give us a like, drop us a comment, and be sure to subscribe. So musicians have to rely, Blech. okay. Musicians, stop laughing at me, <laughs> you cannot. <laughs> we, have to we have to rely on recording equipment a lot now, especially since COVID and everything, the live concerts were down for a full year. So assume, one of our viewers is interested in getting into this. They have a budget of $2,000 and they would like to be recording themselves more. What would you suggest getting? More money. <laughs> but, okay, if but, that's, practically. but practically speaking, if that's not possible. I mean, the problem is, unfortunately, I have discovered that the paradigm you get what you pay for really really unfortunately um, is true when it comes to recording gear. Um, the law of diminishing returns definitely is in effect too, which is to say that a $3,000 microphone doesn't sound 10 times better than the $300 microphone, but it sounds better enough that the more you can spend, and it really has to be at the head and the tail, which is to say the majority of your money should go towards the microphones and the speakers because one is what you're capturing, the other is how you're hearing it. I mean, it helps to have good um, uh, mic preamps, A to D converters, D to A conversion, things like that. Uh, but these days, you know, the inexpensive stuff does a fairly good job of it. Uh, you know, it's not like 30 years ago. 30 years ago, you had to spend $10,000 to get a good A to D converter because all the other ones sounded horrible. Um, nowadays, that's not true. As a matter of fact, the A to D converter in a little portable Zoom recorder is quite good. Um, you know, but the microphones are the thing. And the better the mics, uh, the better your recording will be. It's that simple. What, what are some of the brands maybe for? Well, again, you know, <laughs> it, it's a money thing because to me, the best brands are Neumann, Sheps, mm -hmm. B&K. AKG, uh, Sennheiser, but uh, the condensers, which are the higher end mics of those are all really quite expensive. And I mean, you can get, especially if you go on good old eBay where things can be had for a fraction of their cost new, you can, you can probably get a couple of decent conde condensers for a couple of thousand dollars, which is still kind of rich for, uh, for some people's blood, but it all depends on how important it is to you, for you to capture what you do properly. And it also depends on the instrument, you know, because you're a violinist, you're a pianist. The mics to capture violin and mics to capture piano are completely different, in my opinion. I mean, yes, of course, you can use a good pair of condensers for both, but there's certain aspects of the violin that are better picked up by a more mellow microphone and aspects of the piano that require a more even frequency response and even a slight frequency response boost in the, um, in the treble, depending on how far away you are miking from the instrument. And by the way, I hate miking piano up close. To me, it, it loses all of its character. An upright sounds like a concert grand when you put the mics inside the piano. No, there are these little miniature mics that you put across the plate Ah. Huh. Um, I know people that have used them. I think, I think the sound is airless. It has no resonance to it. You're hearing this punchy. It's probably great in a jazz ensemble it's to give the piano bite because, you know, you're dealing with a lot of instruments with a lot of high frequency uh, content like brass instruments, drums, which have a huge high frequency spike when you strike a snare drum. For example, so it would help if the piano had that kind of um, 
frequency response envelope to break through that as well. So mic in close makes sense there. But for solo piano, for classical, you want the entire range of the instrument. You want the colors. You want everything that makes it, you know, a piano. You don't want to make it part of an ensemble with a lot of screaming instruments. So, you know, uh, you, have to, you have to make those decisions, and it's good to have a collection of microphones and to, uh, you know, to figure out. And it's, it's always trial and error. You never know. It just takes experience. You can't, you can't do it. You can't read a book about it. I mean, the book can give you suggestions, but you still have to figure out. Because the other thing is that, for example, miking piano, every piano speaks a little bit differently. You know, the richness of the piano comes out of a different place, um, depending on whether you're using spaced omnis, which I like better, except in a noisy environment, they don't work as well because they pick up too much outside noise. So then I will use what's called ORTF, which are two cardioids mounted at a 90 degree angle from one another, actually a little more like a 100 degree angle from one another, because they don't pick up as much from the back. But the sound is not as wide and rich as it is, I mean, ideally, it's best to use four. Use two omnis and cardioids in the middle if you have the capability of doing that and, uh, and the time to do the setup. That, that can work well. Unless the space is really quiet, then spaced omnis work the best. You don't have any phase issues, and, uh, and it usually sounds rich and beautiful. And, of course, I have my favorite microphones for recording piano, spaced omni. And for violin, nothing beats a good Sheps. I know you take meticulous care of your piano and the environment here. And I learned a lot from that. And I do the same for mine. Good. I wanted to ask you what you do on a daily basis to maintain this instrument in such a great condition. On a daily basis, you can't do anything. I mean, there's nothing you can do on a daily basis. But I try to maintain the voicing which means calling in somebody, because I don't do this kind of stuff myself, uh, call in, you know, the best voicers I know, best voicer I know, and I want the piano to have a certain character. I, I like the piano to be bright up here, you know, this, uh, because it records well. When you, when you process it, which means add reverb to it, make it sound like a concert hall, if this part up here is too dull, uh, you know, it doesn't speak well enough, um, then the, uh, the recording will sound dull too, it will sound muffled. And then if you try to EQ it to bring up the treble, it brings up noise along with it. So it's best to capture it. So uh, I have this piano voice so that the, the treble is, is, is a little on the bright side. Now some people will sit at the piano and they'll say, oh, it's so bright. I say, don't worry, it records well. And then they hear the result, and the result records well. So, but the other thing is, you know, keep it, keep it, it's so important, the environment is so important. Humidity levels have to be constant. Temperature range shouldn't vary more than 10 or 12 degrees, if possible. You know, it shouldn't go, I mean, ideally, I think it's like 65 to 77, 78. If, if you keep these things within a range and the humidity between, say, 40 and 50 percent, then the tuning holds, the hammers stay stable, and the instrument stays consistent, which is the most important thing because you don't know how many times people have come to me two years later and they want to do an insert in their recording, which has been sitting on the shelf for two years because they haven't figured out if they want to. Or, like, there are several projects I'm involved with that are multiple CDs. And the piano has to sound more or less the same. You don't want CD number six to sound completely different from CD number one. So it's about maintaining it in more or less the same character for a long period of time. It helps that I don't move it. I really think moving kills pianos. Even rolling them around kills them, but putting them on a truck. I, I, used, to, I used to laugh about how piano technicians would say, oh, moving doesn't do anything to pianos. And I say to myself, okay, they've just loaded this piano from Steinway, it was back, back when it was on 58th Street, to go to Carnegie Hall. So they go around the corner, and meanwhile they're going up the highly bumpy 6th Avenue to the highly bumpy 59th Street to the even more bumpy 7th Avenue, and then to the loading dock of Carnegie. 
And meanwhile, the piano is going <laughs> while, it's, while it's going down the street. And you're going to tell me that an object that has 10,000 moving parts and is made mostly out of wood is not going to be affected by that? <laughs> only, only in your dreams. In reality, of course it does. And moving instruments around is, is really not good for the instruments. But, you know, you have to do it. Uh, I never could understand why Carnegie didn't just get a really super great piano as a house piano. But that wouldn't matter anyway, because 80% of pianos are going to say, oh, no, I can't use this instrument. I have to go get blah, you know, instrument from here or there. You know, um, Ricardo La Rosa, who uh, owns Pro Piano, mm -hmm. um, I don't know how much he's doing these days as far as renting, but he used to be the prime Hamburg Steinway renter in New York. And many, many pianists use this stuff. And, you know, certain pianists, Mr. Pogorelich, for example, are exceedingly picky about tuning. In Pogorelich's concerts, what you would see is you'd wa walk into Carnegie and the piano would be covered. Then, literally a minute before he would walk on stage, he would take the cover off and open the piano. And he would play his first half. He'd walk off stage and then Ricard would come out and retune the instrument for the second half. Now, it happens that Ricard is like, you know, Speedy Gonzalez when it comes to tuning a piano. I never saw anybody tune a piano as fast as him. He literally goes up, da 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 Next note. And and literally went up the entire keyboard in about eight minutes. And and retouched the instrument and it sounded perfect after. Here's a, here's a hilariously funny story. When Steinway was on 57th Street, a pianist I know was playing a recital in the rotunda. And I think it must have been a rental or something like that, or or because he I, he wasn't even a Steinway artist. But anyway, they, uh, Steinway decided it wasn't worth their time to, l to leave a technician around. So the technician had left. During the concert, somehow, the rod for the, um, for the damper pedal, somehow it fell out. I don't even understand how that can happen, but it did. And the pianist says, uh... I can't finish the concert. I said, let me take a look at this. Now, I happen to know a little bit about pianos. So, you know, and I had to take out the keyboard, for example, you know, things like that. This is not rocket science. A lot of people know how to do it, but there are people that wouldn't dare. So, you know, of course, I didn't have any tools with me either. You know, there are screws Bitcoin. under here. That's yeah. exactly Bitcoin. what I did. I took a quarter out of my pocket <laughs> and I unscrewed the blocks pulled out, and what had happened, for some reason, the damper rod had moved to the side and it wasn't hitting the, uh, the fulcrum that raises the, uh, you know, it's a piece of wood, mm -hmm. and you, damper rod pushes it up and it pushes up the dampers. So I just reset it in place, and I put the keyboard back, <laughs> and I screwed it back into place, and he was able to finish the concert. When I told my piano tuner what had happened, he made up a fake certificate for me, <laughs> which is on my wall over there, <laughs> that I joined the Tuner Club, and it's like typically under-equipped <laughs> something or other. I don't even remember what it is, but it, it was very, very, very funny. I'm going to say that there are certain people that are never satisfied with what they do, even yeah. though what they do is at such a high level. And these are people that should only be performing. Because this way, you don't get to revisit it afterwards. You just right. get to do what you do. You know, the problem with going into the studio, uh, well, the other problem is, of course, it all has to be video these days. Right. So in spite of the fact that there is a known amount of monkeying around with the audio track. All, isn't it all edited anyway? The video. Well, single camera video can't be edited. But you but can you can, you can fool around with the audio yeah. track. Yeah. I don't recommend doing it because... You, if you have somebody watching who has really good perfect pitch and they see that you strike a D, but they hear an E, they're going to know, know that yeah. the audio track was monkeyed. Yeah. If you do that, they'll disqualify you immediately. They'll say, this is, an ed this oh. is edited, you're out. Yeah, for, you know, for school sort of or whatever. Right. You know, it's best not to do it. It also sounds fake because nobody plays perfectly. There's no such thing. But it's a huge stress for young people to yeah. be comparing yourself to perfect recordings 
And something like this is not uh, able not to achieve. And I tell them that. Yeah. I say, your video is not a recording. Play as a musician and don't worry about the wrong notes because yeah. the wrong notes are not what you are about. You are not a robot. Everybody hits wrong notes. You need you need the psychotherapy sessions after every after every recording or whatever. Well, you know, a lot of people leave the music business for that reason, yeah. because they just they can't deal with the stress of their their self um, inadequacy, their perception of their inadequacy, which doesn't exist. It's only in their head. But that's the reason that they leave the business, they can't, you know, and then they become really amazing amateurs, but, you know, you know, they'll go to medical school and become a doctor who plays really, really well, uh, but at least they don't have the stress of having to walk on stage, you know. It's, uh, there's, a, there's a great psychological component, there's the reconciliation of what you are as a musician and what you can be as a musician and what you should be as a musician, and if you can reconcile that, you can be a performer. Otherwise, you should find another career. <laughs> so on that note, we're going to wrap things up here. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to subscribe, hit like, drop us a comment, and drop Joe a comment. He'll, he'll give us answers any time of the day. So, I promise I not to drop your dropped comment. <laughs> and there's that. Um, you derailed me, man. Sorry. <laughs> Shouldn't be that easy to derail. <laughs> so anyways, cheers, and we'll see you guys next time.